Well, a few days ago, we brought up the Douglas F4D Skyray, because one hit a, hit a train. Well, actually, the train hit it, because it wound up on the tracks. It, there's a whole video about that. We, 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 that's, we don't talk about that here. What we are going to discuss is the Skyray in and of itself, since at least one person asked me to go into more detail regarding the development of this particular aircraft, as it's not brought up very much. And the reason for that is simply that it didn't serve for very long. A little less than 10 years, in fact. It was a carrier-based fighter interceptor, designed and produced by Douglas, and it was later redesignated to the F-6 Sky Ray, but it's the same plane no matter what. It had a crew of one, a length of 45 feet 3 inches, a wingspan of 33 feet 6 inches, a height of 13 feet exactly, and their maximum takeoff weight was 27,116 pounds. They were powered by a single Pratt & Whitney J57P-8, an 8A or an 8B, afterburning turbojet engine. It was capable of delivering 10,200 pounds in thrust dry, but 16,000 with an afterburner. Their maximum speed was 722 miles per hour at sea level. They had a range of 610 nautical miles, a surface ceiling of 55,000 feet, and they were armed with four 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons. They could also carry unguided rockets, six pods of seven, or four pods of 19. They could also carry four AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, or two 2,000-pound bombs. They were equipped with an APQ-50A radar, and an Aero 13F fire control radar. The origin of the Skyray actually dates back to a design study that was performed by Douglas and funded by the United States Navy. Known as D-571-1, the study was for a pure interceptor capable of climbing extremely fast by the standards of the time, and used a Delta Wing configuration, to be powered by two Westinghouse J-34 turbojet engines. This particular design had a pretty thick wing and no conventional fuselage, besides a pod-like cockpit, similar to a flying wing, except it did have a tail. It based itself on a lot of German research, particularly work done by aerodynamicist Alexander Lipich, who had moved to the United States after the end of World War II. His work had been examined by Douglas' design team, and they took advantage of some of the stuff he figured out. The results of the study did interest the Navy, so they issued a contract in June of 1947 to proceed with preliminary investigation and engineering works on the concept up to the mock-up stage. Over time, the aircraft that would eventually become the Skyray began to take shape. One of the first changes was a significant reduction to the wing's thickness to reduce drag and therefore increase high-speed capabilities. They also threw out the idea of using two J-34 engines and instead opted to go for a single Westinghouse J-40 engine. That, that, was a really bad idea. But at the time, they wouldn't have known this. As I mentioned when I talked about the Demon, the J-40 was a complete disaster. It never worked right, and was cancelled. So this would significantly hamper progress on the Skyray as it had with the Demon. But we'll go into more detail in a bit. Since, again, at the time they chose to do this, it wasn't known how bad the J-40 would wind up. The early design only used a single hydraulic system, so they had to add measures to permit manual reversion in the event of a failure. The early design focused on the primary armament being rockets, housed in pylon-mounted pods. The Navy did issue a formal operational requirement in 1948, and while technically other companies could submit proposals in line with the requirement, it was already pretty clear that Douglas was going to get it no matter what. The Navy at the time was looking for a very powerful interception aircraft that could destroy enemies at an altitude of 50,000 feet within five minutes of the alarm being sounded. They were worried about threats posed to their carrier battle groups by high-altitude Soviet bombers. And while jets were certainly the future, at the time they had significant difficulties. For one thing, they burned through fuel like crazy, and as a result they had very limited endurance. Plus, many of them didn't climb quite as well as what the Navy wanted. They wanted a new jet that could reach its operational altitude extremely quickly. So that's what Douglas focused on with the Sky Ray. However, there were a bunch of design changes that did delay the mock-up review by almost a year, though it did eventually get looked at by the Navy in March of 1949. The Navy had some criticisms, though not too many. 
Their concern mostly was the nose. The nose-up attitude was greater than had been anticipated, and they were worried about the pilot's external visibility, so Douglas would have to make some slight modifications there. But the biggest problem that was starting to crop up was the J-40 engine, which, like I said, was... no. As such, Douglas' design team decided to make accommodations that would facilitate the use of other engines as a contingency in case the J-40 never came to fruition. Which it didn't, so that was a good call. The prototype would therefore be outfitted with an Allison J-35 instead of the J-40. But that wasn't a long-term solution. The J-35 wasn't as strong as the J-40 promised, and while they were decent engines, they weren't going to be able to push the Sky Ray to the performance that Douglas needed. So a long-term replacement for the J-40 was actually the Pratt & Whitney J-57. It was more powerful, but the problem with it was that it was considerably larger than the J-35. The original inlet design on the Sky Ray was not a good match for the J-57. It would not work. They would have to make significant redesigns to make sure it fit, and that caused significant delays in the overall project. The first production standard Sky Ray wouldn't even fly until June of 1954, and even there, there were still some issues. The aft section, for example, needed to be reprofiled to eliminate some undesirable buffeting that was occurring, and to reduce drag. Production aircraft weren't delivered until early 1956, though the planes were declared ready for fleet operation in April of that year. And they were distinctive. The one thing they retained the entire time was that big old Delta Wing. They're named for it, in fact, as they looked like manta rays. Their unique profile actually led to them being one of the most recognizable early jet fighters. You could tell if you were looking at the Sky Ray generally. Really, there was nothing else quite like it, at least when it came to America. During April of 1956, the squadron, known as VC-3, was the first to obtain operational status with the Sky Ray. And the Navy weren't the only ones to utilize it. The Marines also took advantage of the planes. And by September of 1962, they were no longer called the F-4D, but instead the F-6A Sky Rays. This was done due to the Department of Defense choosing to adopt the Uniform Aircraft Designation System to keep everything a lot more consistent across the board. The Navy had to fall in line with the U.S. Air Force's aircraft designation system, and therefore the Sky Ray was redesignated. Hence why F-4D Sky Ray shouldn't be confused with the D variant of the McDonnell Douglas F-4. As these are two completely different planes, but most of you probably already knew that. Now in terms of the aircraft's performance and service, well, they did do exactly what they were supposed to do. Some people consider them a failure, because of their short service life, but that's not fair to them, because Douglas did exactly what the Navy asked them to do, create an interceptor that could climb really fast. And they did it. Even with the issues with the engine, the Sky Ray wound up setting a new time-to-altitude record, flying from a standing start to 49,221 feet in just 2 minutes and 36 seconds at a 70-degree pitch angle. So, if they were so good at that... Why didn't they stick around a lot longer? Well, frankly, it's because that's all they were good at. They were good for that one thing and nothing else. They weren't a flexible platform. Douglas had created a very specialized jet, and that's fine, but by the time the Sky Ray was ready, the Navy's needs had changed quite a bit. The demand now was for aircraft with multi-mission capabilities, and the Sky Ray was just not cut out for this. It really could only do the interception role. Other aircraft became available that were much more flexible in this regard. Like the aforementioned F-4, which frankly could do pretty much whatever you wanted. There's a reason we built so many of them, because they could be utilized for a lot of different roles. The Sky Ray just couldn't. You couldn't really use it that well for ground attack. You couldn't really use it that well as a dogfighter. It was meant to intercept. And yeah, it was great for that, but there were other aircraft available that could do that and a whole bunch of other things, too! That's why the Sky Ray slowly fell out of favor. And the last operational squadron flew the Sky Ray until February of 1964. Though a few Sky Rays, four to be precise, were used for experiments by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, which was later renamed to NASA. So they were still good as testing platforms just because of their unique capabilities. 
The Sky Ray sadly got a bit of a bad lot, since at the end of the day, by the time they were in service, their purpose had largely passed them by. They never really got a chance to shine, even though, for what they were built for, they weren't really good at it. It's just they weren't really good at much else beyond that exact thing. They were too specialized. Douglas actually didn't give up on the overall concept, though. They did try to push the design further, and created the Douglas F5D Sky Lancer. Four of those would wind up being built, and by all regards, they were actually very good. They were much faster than the Sky Ray, for example, and offered much more modern capabilities. To be honest, the only reason they weren't accepted was because of economic concerns, believe it or not. That may sound weird, but it was because, at the time, the Skylancer's capabilities weren't that different from the Vought F8 Crusader. It was already on order. And Douglas, in particular, was already building a very large portion of the Navy's airplanes. And if they gave them another contract, that would push them even closer to having a monopoly on aircraft production when it came to the Navy. They didn't want to allow that, so the F-5D was rejected, not because it was bad, but because they just didn't want to give Douglas any more of the market share. Two of those wound up with NASA as well for further testing, and both the NASA ones actually wound up being preserved and are on display at two different museums. The Sky Ray also got lucky and had a pretty decent amount of preservation. There are at least seven production Sky Rays on static display, as well as an example of the original prototype. And due to their unique features, they are a lot of people's favorites, even though they didn't last very long. They have a distinctive appeal about them, and it's just a shame they never really got the shine. But that's how technology progresses sometimes. You make one thing, but almost immediately, it's already obsolete. That's kind of what happened with the Sky Ray. They were not bad, it's just that their time had simply passed them by. And with that, a special thank you. That's all my underwater train funders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Aurora Videos, Lord Off 444, A Person 723, Royal Hunters 2860, Isaac for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Will Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Talinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terrell, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, Railroad Preserver 2000, No, Eric Hutton, Williard Conklin, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mitchell Cole, Mr. Sleepy, Dr. Race 78, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.